Welcome to CMIA chat with uh, Major Casey Anderson, Canadian Intelligence Corps Regimental Major. Our history as, as an Army Intelligence Corps in the Canadian Army is extremely relevant to us today. Okay. Hey, so I want to start off by talking about, uh, you know, the historical links between the CNC and um, and and modern times, modern intelligence, and and I really want to get into why it's relevant. Like, why is um, our history relevant to what we're doing today? I would offer that um, you know our history. As a, I, will, I will elaborate on that, but I I would you know sort of pause it uh, if I had a thesis that it's relevant to us today in the same way that any history is is relevant. Um, in that our past, from my perspective, is incredibly important uh, towards understanding who we are um, today and, and the context context in which we live within the world at large. And so, you know, for the intelligence corps today, um, we are in this hybrid uh, joint intelligence branch, which I, I imagine many of our predecessors, you know, prior to uh, uh, the 1960s probably would have never imagined. Um, so that, and that's, that's within the unified structure of the modern Canadian armed forces, which again, um, is sort of hard, hard, probably difficult to imagine if you were, um, you know, serving between, uh, the twenties and, uh, and fifties. Um, but it is the reality in which we serve today. And many, many of our, um, uh, proudest achievements, uh, have, have of course happened recently, but there's a great deal of them that have happened, um, historically. Um, particularly in the, the period uh, of the Second World War and earlier, and I I believe that for any uh, Canadian Army, you know, uh, intelligence soldier or officer, uh, uh, but particularly leaders, understanding our connection uh, to our predecessors, particularly the Corps of Guides and um, what I will call the Corps of Cyclists, although that that is a, a, a technically incorrect term, is is really as fundamental as knowing uh, the intelligence cycle, which I I appreciate is a, a bit of a bold. Um, claim, but I will unpack that a little bit more. Um, we're all aware about the, you know, the conversation that has has been occurring and, and remains ongoing about culture uh, in the Canadian Armed Forces. And I think that um, our historical, the, the historical, you know, the, our history is um, is very, in a very important aspect uh, to our culture. And so, um, you know, I, uh, I knew that you were uh, going to ask a, a version of this question. So I actually looked up, um, you know, culture and the, uh, the definition rather. And so culture, at least according to Wikipedia, is our uh, social behavior, our norms, including our beliefs, our customs, traditions, knowledge, habits, et cetera, et cetera. And it includes both the, the non-material and the material. And what what thing is more rich in all of those things, both the non-material portions of culture and, and the material um, mm -hmm. portions of culture, than military history. Um, we've, got, uh, we've got some pretty jazzy uniforms, uh, interesting badges and medals, um, very, very interesting uh, sort of approaches to customs and traditions. Uh, certainly very riveting, uh, from my perspective, stories about, you know, gallantry and bravery and and you know everything in between, um, and that's the sort of thing that I think in 2023, in the you know the perhaps um, culture obsessed uh, Canadian Armed Forces, that we can turn to as a as a source of strength. And I believe really that there are many positive which positives which can come uh, from understanding the history of our core, um, particularly regarding the core of guides and, and our connection to it. Uh, sort of by, with, and through the cyclists, which I will um, briefly elaborate on if you'll indulge me a little bit further. Um, so as uh, as Colonel Scarab uh, knows all too well, uh, and I'm just reciting uh, the brief that he gave me in uh, uh, 2011 now, um, but uh, Army Intelligence in Canada predates uh, 1903, but it was in 1903 when uh, the Corps of Guides was formally established Really, in the aftermath um, of of what I would say are two major sort of um, recurring events, the first recurring event was the uh, the Anglo the series of Anglo Boer Wars, which had happened uh, prior to 1903, and then of, of course um, this you know the uh, I'm trying to think of the sort of uh, modern term for it, not the uh, 
forgive me. I'm going to I'm going to use probably an outdated term here, but what what we term now or sorry, what have, has been previously termed as uh, you know wars of rebellion uh, on the uh, particularly on the Canadian plains, and then um, intermixed with the sort of uh, the ever looming threat of who is ironically now our closest uh, ally, the United States of America. Um, and so the concept for the core of guides in, in simple, when it was established, was a sort of like a pseudo light cavalry slash human slash mapping unit, um, which when you put it like that, is maybe that's something we could do with today. I don't know. Um, it sounds pretty, it sounds pretty interesting. It might help with uh, recruiting, but I, I digress. The whole concept was that we would have um guides uh, officers and soldiers sort of dispersed throughout the hinterland of uh, of Canada which still today much of these places are you know relatively sparsely inhabited but their role was to understand um you know the weather enemy and terrain of their specific locale uh, wherever they happen to find themselves in Canada and that I think the concept in brief was that in the event of trouble you know you you define what that means but in the event of trouble in their locale uh, the government of Canada, which again at the time uh, was in 1903, I think I've got my dates right, was uh, at that point effectively wholly responsible um, for its own defense. There were still some British garrisons in, I believe, uh, Halifax and uh, Quebec City and probably a few other places. But the, my point is, um, you know, if help was going to be coming from uh, from the United Kingdom, it was going to it was going to take a while, and so. Any help that was going to be coming was going to be coming probably uh, from uh, soldiers already in Canada, probably soldiers of the uh, what we would call today the Army Reserve or at the time the non-permanent uh, active militia. And so those soldiers, you know, who might be taking a train uh, for two or three days from, I don't know, like, uh, you know, Kitchener, Berlin, Ontario, uh, as, it, as I guess it was at the time, all the way out, um, you know, to, uh, you know, uh, Duck Lake in uh, in the prairies. Um, they wouldn't know which farmers were friendly, where they could, you know, feed and water their horses, uh, which bridges were safe to put uh, cannon across, et cetera, et cetera. And so that was the concept of the Corps of Guides. And when um, war was declared um, against, uh, you know, effectively what we would recognize today as Germany in 1914, uh, there was an, an, an uh, order in council, which was given out um, to all uh, members of the non-permanent active militia or the army reserve and the permanent force or the regular force to effectively mobilize at uh, camp what would become camp el Carchet. and of course uh the guides uh were were mobilized along with everyone else they reported um to val Carche en masse and uh effectively at some some point in the process there was a um a staff officer i've been picturing like uh, you know, the 1914 equivalent of, of Ian Ferguson with a clipboard. And uh, he's looking, he's got on his clipboard, he's got the table of organization for uh, a, a, an infantry, an expeditionary infantry division. And on it, uh, there was no role for the Corps of Guides, um, not only because they, they hadn't been accounted for in this expeditionary force plan. And then on top of that, the, of course, the French and Belgians were, were uh, and are thankfully our allies and so they would be responsible if anyone needed guides and needed to know about, you know, which farmers were friendly, et cetera, et cetera. Well, that would, of course, be their role. Um, that would that would only make sense. It's their country. So the guides were found without a role, without a home in this, uh, what would become the first Canadian contingent. And the, uh, you know, the, the adjutant or, or whomever it was uh, of the day uh, was looking down uh, his list and saw, ah, but we're missing. A divisional cyclist company because the what was being formed would become the first canadian division it was a, a effectively a british um uh, modeled um uh, expeditionary uh, infantry division uh, that division had something called mounted troops at the divisional level which were the effectively the personal property of the divisional commander uh who were meant to grosso modo do sort of light cavalry and intelligence uh, collection type duties uh, there was a squadron of cavalry. Well, Canada had uh, probably actually, from a force composition perspective, probably too much cavalry at the time. So filling filling those billets wasn't an issue. But we didn't have anyone doing uh, a bicycle troops function, despite the fact that this um, function had existed in the British Army since 1888. 
Um, so perhaps, you know, uh, the, uh, the analogy is that the bicycle was the F-35 of uh, 1914. We were late to the party, um, but we decided that we wanted them. We needed bicycles. And of course, um, again, I'm referring to the 1914 of, uh, of the Edge, um, who's looking at his list and you, the logical connection is not, it's not a huge leap. A bicycle is basically like a horse. Uh, you, you ride it, you can put stuff on it. You thankfully don't have to feed it. Uh, so it's a lot cheaper from that perspective to, to maintain and care for. Um, and if it becomes uh, damaged, you can probably repair it. You don't have to, you know, uh, you know, not to be too grim, but like shoot it in a field and, and have a really sad moment. Uh, you can probably just chuck it on a scrap heap or, you know, replace the pedal or whatever's gone, uh, gone wrong. My point is uh, not entirely, um, but a large portion and particularly the officers uh, from uh, for the first Canadian, uh, what would become the first Canadian divisional cyclist company. Uh, many of those people were drawn from the Corps of Guides because it was seen to be a natural fit. Uh, in the aftermath of the war, we'll skip ahead. In the aftermath of the war, uh, the Canadian Expeditionary Force, um, which was the effectively the Canadian army uh, in France and Belgium, was disbanded and, and sort of reconverted to peacetime. Um, a series of um, commissions began in Canada looking at the composition of, um, of our, at the time, Army Reserve or non-permanent active militia, and looking to rebalance it. Uh, to match it both in uh, character and function. And when I say character, I mean preserving the customs and traditions of, of the Canadian Expeditionary Force, which had largely recruited regionally and aligning aligning existing militia units with uh, the historical units that had effectively ceased to exist when the, the Canadian Expeditionary Force was disbanded. As part of that process, there was something called the Otter Commission. The Otter Commission recommended uh, that the uh, mounted detachments of the Corps of Guides, as they had existed from 1903 until 1920, be uh, not disbanded, but converted and re-rolled into cyclist companies. That happened uh, as a result of the recommendations of the Otter Commission. So effectively, <clears throat> in the aftermath of the First World War, the Corps of Guides, knowing that they would be, um, if they were going to be needed in an expeditionary role in the future, uh, the sort of core guides concept uh, was no longer that relevant and that they should maintain the capability to uh, deploy and fight as cyclists. And so that's what they did until their disbandment in 1929. Um, but throughout that process, uh, members of the core of guides were responsible for the, what we would recognize today as the uh, military intelligence function in Canada. So in the interest of not going too long, uh, I will stop there. But that is why we have a connection to this thing that to people today might seem pretty arcane. Um, and that's why I believe we have uh, lots of reason to uh, to maintain our connection with it. So, hey, Casey, that was awesome. Um, I'm sure we could actually use that uh, or, you know, if we can ever get uh, YouTube on, on DWAN, um, you know, the school could just use that as part of the uh, future lecture series on, uh, you know, for the army serials, uh, you know, our, our history and heritage. Um, so there must have been a lot of interesting lessons uh, and uh, stories that are really relevant to us today, you know, um, but, you know, interesting lessons from them, but interesting lessons that also affect us today. Um, could you share a, one or two of those with us that you think are uh, relevant uh, to how we do business now? I will do uh, three, but I will keep them much shorter than the last one. Okay, um, perfect. <laughs> so the the first one. So I spoke. I spoke about um, you know the, the the first contingent, which became the first uh, Canadian division uh, mobilized or raised at Belcarche, and then deployed to England, and then shortly thereafter um, to France and Belgium. Um, so that was uh, the first cyclist unit that was um, created, and um, I guess what I what I'll sort of pause and I, I, it's I think it's interesting to sort of drill right down because I've been talking about you know the organization, um, which is pretty ethereal and I mean if we're being honest, not particularly interesting. So maybe don't play that clip. To um, I mean it's interesting to me, but uh, <laughs> my wife my wife doesn't find it particularly interesting after um, you know seven years of uh, dinner time conversation being about how the uh, first Canadian contingent was organized. Um, I digress. My point is. Uh, I thought it'd be useful to sort of focus in on a, a single uh, individual versus just, you know, uh, how how things were administered. Um, although it's the military, so there is actually an administrative component uh, to this story. 
Uh, so uh, I have, I'm very fortunate to have in my uh, personal collection. Uh, you can see here, uh, and I'll send you, sir, I'll send you a photo of this that's much better than this, but this is a, um, this is a medal mm -hmm. and it's the uh, uh, Imperial Russian Order of St. George uh, third class. And I, it, it was awarded to a fellow named um, Private Arthur William Dunham. And that medal, uh, which I'll actually hold up again. Uh, so this medal is extremely significant uh, to the history of our Corps because it's actually the first gallantry award. Uh, and I'm, again, very fortunate to have this in my collection. Uh, but the first gallantry award ever to a member of uh, one of our predecessor Corps or services. And I, I know that because it's engraved on the rim uh, with with Private Dunham's uh, name uh, and regimental number and all that stuff. And, and we're able to research this stuff uh, pretty easily because much of the uh, records of, of what I'm describing to you have been digitized. So I will give you a really brief uh, biography of Private Dunham and I will I will explain uh, the reason he was awarded this, uh, this award. Um, so he finished the war as a uh, corporal. So uh, Corporal Arthur Dunham, uh, born in Cambridge, England, was a 27-year-old electrician who attested for service with the 1st Canadian Divisional Cyclist Company at Valcarche on the 10th of September, uh, 1914. So very early um, after war was declared. He arrived in France in uh, February, 1915. And Private Dunham, then Private Dunham, fought with the 1st Divisional Cyclist Company uh, at what would become their very first uh, battle, uh, which was uh, known today as the Second Battle of Ypres. Um, and he was he was awarded the uh, Imperial Russian St. George Medal, um, third class, for his gallantry on the 25th of April, 1915, uh, during specifically during the action at St. Julien. Um, so that's the action which occurred. It was a series of uh, attacks and counterattacks, both by us and the uh, Germans in the aftermath of that very famous uh, gas attack, which had occurred uh, two days uh, previously. Um, separate, uh, later on in the Second Battle of Ypres, Private Dunham would actually go on to be wounded in the right arm by gunshot on the 11th of May, 1915. And he would uh, convalesce uh, in, uh, in, the, in the UK where he spent the remainder of the war um, working predominantly at the Canadian Records Office in, in London, but also serving with the Canadian Reserve Cyclist Company, so, so training uh, junior soldiers to go over to France. And of course, um, I imagine that, that he was probably held in, in quite high esteem, given that he was the first cyclist soldier to receive uh, a gallantry award. So I imagine that his advice to uh, young soldiers was probably taken quite seriously. Uh, Dunham uh, returned to Canada and, and left the military in Regina on the 13th of February, 1919, and he remained in Saskatchewan, uh, where he farmed a ranch uh, that, which he owned until his death in 1965. So uh, why did he receive this award? Well, for a few reasons. One, at the time, uh, Imperial Russia were, uh, were some of our closest allies, and indeed they were responsible uh, for having the sort of uh, Eastern Front open against, uh, you know, what we would what we would again call today the Germany or the Austro-Hungarian uh, uh, Empire. Um, so the citation for his award, I think, is really uh, emotive and, and indicative of the role of the cyclists. And I think you can see the connection between what they were doing uh, and, and the intelligence function in a very tactile uh, sense. So his Imperial Majesty, the Emperor of Russia, has been graciously pleased to confer with the approval of His Majesty the King the undermentioned award for gallantry and distinguished conduct in the field, the Medal of St. George, third class. Uh, for excellent and prompt reconnaissance under rifle and shell fire in front of Vilce, uh, which is in Belgium, on the 25th of April, 1915, during our counterattack, he went time after time forward to the firing line with orders and to obtain reports and information with regards to the disposition of both our troops and the location of the enemy. So, you have to put yourself in the context of the time. And, and of course, um, you know, he wasn't working on some, you know, some sort of digitized uh, process. He was going out and physically retrieving the information and bringing it back um, literally uh, to, to the divisional commander. Um, again, because this, this was the divisional level troops and, and his job, I'm sure there were probably some middlemen who were quick to, uh, you know, uh, parse down the information from private Dunham and, and, you know, be the ones to bring it to the uh, general officer commanding. But my point is, um, he was he was intrinsically linked to that uh, what what we would call I guess the intelligence cycle today. Um, the next story, which I would like to qu more quickly tell, 
is <clears throat> about the uh, the veterans of the uh, battalion writ large. Um, and I think I think this is just one of the most charming um, pieces of history about our predecessors. And it speaks, if you want to talk about culture, it speaks to, I think, what perhaps our highest ambitions um, should be. So um, in the aftermath of the First World War, uh, when the uh, Canadian Expeditionary Force was disbanded, uh, most I mentioned already that most units of the uh, of the Expeditionary Force had, had recruited uh, territorially. That's not universally true, but the, the cyclists were actually rather unusual in that they they were a uh, what I would call like a national um, core. And so they didn't have, you know, uh, what we would call today a home station. There wasn't an armories where all the cyclists, cyclist veterans <clears throat> could get together at and, um, you know, meet up, uh, whether to continue serving in the reserves or otherwise. They went back to their you know their homes all so, they, so they went about they went about their lives and indeed uh approximately 1200 uh, men uh served in the uh what we would call the cyclist uh, uh core i guess which was really an amalgam of actually about six different units um and many of them were actually uh had nothing to do with soldiering before the war and many of them would go on to be uh, very influential canadians um i won't read the list out to you but if you look up uh, the cyclist battalion, Canadian Corps Cyclist Battalion's Wikipedia page, and look at uh, you know notable members in the uh, the bottom. The list is surprisingly long and includes um, chief diplomats to the to the United States of America. Uh, you know our most at, and at the time when this was happening, absolutely our most important ally. Uh, provincial premiers, uh, lieutenant governors of provinces. Uh, it's uh, many people involved in uh, academia, not not just a professor, as if I could even do that myself, but. Um, people are running, uh, you know, departments at universities uh, and deans of universities. <clears throat> so really, um, really, a, a really interesting collection of people from uh, a relatively small pool and drawn from all across the country. So my my point with this story is that the cyclists didn't really have a home, a singular home in the aftermath of the war. And uh, whereas many other regiments did. And so they many other regiments uh, were able to maintain those uh camaraderie type connections, which are actually very important, as we know, uh, to people's sort of uh, well-being just generally. I'm not even referring to mental health, uh, just just generally. It's good to be able to connect, uh, as we're doing right now, with people with similar uh, interests and experiences. Um, so that was not available to them. Um, <clears throat> and indeed, uh, the cyclist function went over to the Corps of Guides, but most, most of the people who had been um, cyclists, uh, soldiers and officers uh, in the war didn't continue in the military at all. So it wasn't until 1934 when um, I guess enough time had passed and, uh, you know, old comrades had, you know, had been dying and there was probably an impetus to try and get the band back together, as it were. And so uh, in Toronto in 1934, there was something called the Canadian Corps Reunion, uh, where veterans from the Corps uh, were invited to sort of uh, congregate at Toronto um, and uh, and look for their old old comrades. There were sort of tents and tables set up, you know, 214th Battalion over here. You can go and, you know, congregate at the table and see if you recognize anyone. No, I wasn't there very long. Okay, I'll walk over to the 17th Battalion table and so on and so forth. And it was at, it was at this reunion where for the first time, to my knowledge, there, it was the first uh, sort of formal congregation of men from the battalion, um, and I'm not a mathematician, but like 15-ish years, um, which must have been really quite emotional, I, I suspect. And it was there that they decided to form the Cyclist Battalion Association. And uh, again, it was really more like a Cyclist Corps Association because they took they took all members, including men uh, who had never served in the battalion, but had been in one, of the, one or two of these other... Um, uh, cyclist units, which I'm sort of lumping under the, the cyclist core uh, title. Um, and it's really a real, it's just a really charming story. Um, they never set out to sort of, you know, seek fame or recognition. Um, they maintained um, a journal uh, or, you know, internal journal or, or sort of news, more like a newspaper called the Cyclone, uh, and it, which was maintained for, I think, almost 50 years, or maybe even over 50 years. Uh, after the association was formed in 1934, and it was if you if you have the privilege to go and read uh, copies of the cyclone, which which are held at the um, uh, library uh, library archives of the Canadian War Museum and elsewhere, but the the sort of only full uh, repository, to my knowledge, is there. It's it's some of the most like inane uh, material that you could ever read. You'd think, why were they going about you know recording you know 
Bob Smith has, has just had his third child. Sort of like really bizarre things that were getting mailed out across the Canada, all across Canada and even the world. And it's because they care deeply about one another. They weren't really interested so much in capturing, uh, and at least initially, the, the history of the, uh, the, the battalion and the, and the independent companies. They were just trying to find out what Bob Smith was up to, because I've been thinking about Bob Smith. And gosh, I haven't seen him since we were in that trench together in Belgium. And I, I just think it's uh, it's it's see, it's really hard to convey. But it, and I, I, I will close it with a more personal vignette that sort of indicate that to me gives the, the depth of the story. But it's so I just think it's so charming that they were for 50 plus years organized in finding out what one another were doing and, and not and not petitioning the government, you know, for a monument or anything like that. It had nothing to do with really the wartime service. It had everything to do with the uh, the friends that they'd made along the way, as the saying goes. And I I think there's a lot to be said for that from a cultural perspective, a lot. Uh, the last vignette, which links directly to that, is uh, the story, which many of you will know, but uh, I will retell it briefly for posterity. Um, Dick Ellis and Billy Richardson, who were the last two cyclists. Um, rather alarmingly, Dick Ellis was the first president of the uh, association, and he was also the um, uh, probably the most frequent president of this, the association, and he was also the editor of um, its journal, The Cyclone. And so uh, in 1937, when they, I believe that was the year they held this, the, the association held its first formal reunion after the 1934 reunion. And then they held uh, reunions at least once a year, but sometimes two to three times a year, uh, every year thereafter until the 80s. My point is in 1937, at their sort of first uh, full up reunion, which was disconnected from all the other veterans of the of Canadian Corps, they just brought out, uh, you know, people that they've been reaching out to through telephone books and all sorts of stuff. And they had they had a bottle of Paul Roger champagne, which which many of us will know about, which Dick Ellis had purchased uh, to form a, a tontine. And uh, the concept of a tontine is that uh, you know the last people to uh, the last person typically to be alive reaps the rewards of the tontine. Most tontines are monetary. Um, this was a bottle of champagne. Uh, you can probably see where this is going because the story doesn't end, I think, until 1994. So this this bottle of champagne kicked around. Um, mostly in Toronto, from my understanding, probably being uh, kept in uh, completely inappropriate uh, champagne storage uh, conditions, you know, in the, the top shelf of somebody's closet uh, for 40 years, uh, getting effectively cooked, you know, in an apartment that has no air conditioning. You, you see where I'm going. Anyways, so Dick Ellis, and I say rather alarmingly, because he was the one that purchased this, and, and uh, at every reunion uh, for the next 50 odd years, they would hold this bit, this bottle of champagne aloft and toast uh, with another drink to the last two cyclists. And the intent was for the last two cyclists to drink this bottle of champagne together. Um, sure enough, uh, fast forward uh, 50 plus years and Dick Ellis, um, oh, sorry, almost 60 years. And Dick Ellis miraculously is one of the last two people alive. Uh, that probably raises some questions um, about how that's possible. But anyways, I, I digress. Uh, and it was uh, Dick Ellis in his son's apartment in Toronto with another fellow named Billy Richardson. And they uh, they they got together in, in Dick's son's apartment and opened this bottle uh, and drank it. And they toasted to the battalion, which, again, is just a very charming sort of, uh, you know, epilogue to this entire story. Um, the champagne had obviously gone off long, long ago. And uh, but being clever old soldiers, they had, I'm assuming, quite a few more uh, in reserve. And uh, so those were opened and uh, the, the sort of offending bottle was uh, quickly disposed of, quietly disposed of. But it's currently uh, in the, the library and archives of the Canadian War Museum. And it was last sort of trotted out. Um, it was brought actually to France, interestingly enough, uh, in 19, I'm uh, sorry, in, in um, 2017, no, sorry, 2018 is part of the uh, centennial uh, commemorations of the end of the war. It was put on display uh, at Vimy Ridge, um, which is significant because the battalion both fought at Vimy Ridge, um, uh, which is obviously quite significant from a national perspective, uh, but they had also been responsible for a lot of the tunneling operations, which led up to Vimy Ridge, and they had... Um, uh, tied someone someone along the way had kept a bag of chalk from Grange Tunnel, which is one of the tunnels, a uh, very famous tunnel and one of the tunnels that the cyclists work on worked on. And they had affixed this bottle, a bag of chalk, sorry, to the now empty bottle. Um, 
again, really tying the soldiers uh, to each other and to the uh, literally the soil uh, that they fought over uh, and, and worked on in France. Um, and of note, of import, uh, Billy Richardson and Dick Ellis had both originally joined as uh, as members of the Corps of Guides. Um, you know, so again, that connection between Corps of Guides, the Corps of Guides and the cyclists, the guides at the time were responsible for recruiting uh, into the cyclists. And so that's that's how they found themselves in the cyclists. They went to a Corps of Guides recruiting office. I think both of them were from Toronto and said, hello, I'd like to go to France, please. And they said, right this way, we've got uh, we've got just the thing for you for a quick trip. Um, so those are my three vignettes. Perfect. That, that was awesome, Casey. Um, so now I've got a, uh, I've got some questions for you so we can get to know you a little bit better. Um, I've got three of them, actually, and this is something that we've uh, stolen from Tradox, uh, the Convergence podcast. And uh, the first one is, uh, what are you currently reading? I am, uh, I'm rereading uh, a book which my father gave to me, um, gosh, probably 20 years ago. Um, and it's Edwin Abbott's Flatland, a romance of many dimensions. Uh, <laughs> it was written written in the uh, late nineteenth century. Uh, I haven't I haven't read this book since uh, uh, well about about twenty years ago when I was first given it. Um, but if you're not familiar, I strongly strongly recommend it. It's a uh, it's a short book. It's a novella. I I started it uh, yesterday on the, on the flight back to uh, to Italy. Um, but it's, uh, it's, it's satire and it's, it's written from the perspective. So Ed, Edwin Abbott was a, I believe a Roman Catholic, um, priest. Uh, he, he was certainly a religious scholar of some sort. Um, and the book is written from the perspective of a, uh, a square who, who lives on a two dimensional plane. And I won't give the, the game away. But he is visited by a sphere from the third dimension, and this uh, effectively breaks the square's brain um, because he becomes a prophet uh, to all the other people of uh, Flatland where he lives. Uh, they, of course, think he's completely nuts because he's trying to describe uh, something in the third dimension, which is something that if you were to live on a two-dimensional plane would be very difficult for you to conceive. The whole thing's a, a metaphor effectively for uh, for religion. In the existence of uh, of heaven uh, and God, et cetera, et cetera, but also even dimensions um, beyond our own, uh, which is it's yeah, it's 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 great. Uh, I'm really enjoying it. I'm about halfway through. Um, the only thing that stopped me was falling asleep on my uh, my flight. So yeah, <laughs> I'll be I'll be opening up again uh, after this weekend. Perfect. That's awesome, Casey. Um, so next question is, tell us something about yourself that uh, most people won't know. You know, some of the people will know it, but but of course, you know, that you want to share, which will become public uh, once you tell us about this. Yes, sure, sure. <laughs> um, uh, <laughs> this isn't like a security interview? No, uh, no, not at all. No, okay, gosh, no. Um, perfect. Colonel Babby told us about his uh, fly fishing, for example. Oh, I'm not nearly as interesting as Colonel Babby. <laughs> he's uh, he's an Oxford man or Cambridge or something <laughs> something important. Um, yes, exactly. I uh, gosh, I don't even know. I am the only uh, intelligence officer in the CAF who is who is a graduate of the Royal Army Survey Course uh, in the United Kingdom. Um, there's a longer story there, but if you do if you do badly enough on the basic end officers course, they post you to the uh, mapping and charting establishment. Uh, I'm I think I'm the only person that's ever been posted to the mapping and charting establishment after uh, Bioc, so that tells you how badly I did. <laughs> and um, I owe the I owe the uh, Royal Canadian Engineers um, my firstborn, or maybe just a debt of gratitude if they'll take it, but. Uh, I was sent on on that course uh, through them. I was sponsored by uh, the mapping and charting establishment uh, to go and do that course uh, in, instead of an engineer. And I uh, met my wife there. Uh, so nice. yeah, and so that's why I have a firstborn. Um, <laughs> so there are other people who I think have been granted the qualification uh, after, um, uh, I guess, you know, uh, commissioning from the ranks uh, or, or, or rebadging re after being a geotech, but I, I think I'm still the only person to ever actually attend uh, the geo officers course in the UK, uh, which I'm proud of. Hmm. That's that's awesome. That's that's really great. 
So now the the hardest question and the one you'll get mocked for the most is uh, what's your favorite movie and why? Oh, okay. Uh, <laughs> uh, my favorite film is uh, is The Man Who Would Be King, uh, oh. which I shouldn't be mocked for because it's a classic. <laughs> and I'm seeing some thumbs up uh, from, yeah. from my dear friend Lars Peniston. Um, John Huston is the director. I think it was 1973 when it was made, maybe maybe another time in the 70s. Um, but it's considered to be John Huston's best film. It's shot in uh, on location, I believe, in Afghanistan. Um, it's a like adventure film about uh, you know two old uh, retired senior NCOs from the British Army who have no prospects. Facing them to go back to uh, back to normal civilian life in uh, in England, um, so they effectively uh, choose to to demobilize in India uh, and then go and invade uh, a neighboring country with with hopes of um, effectively becoming uh, leaders in that country for the purposes of ransacking it. Um, but it's uh, Sean Connery, uh, Michael Caine, Christopher Plummer. Um, not exactly an ensemble cast, but certainly uh, one to be reckoned with. And uh, absolutely, like if I need to put on a, a film in the background, uh, that's my absolute go-to. Nice. Really nice. 